you didn't tell me that you were having me like sing on a communist manifesto. <laughs> who, who was it? You're not going to tell me. Uh, hello and welcome to the Red Shutter Club episode three. Oh, wow! Today I have with me <laughs> the the Ian Prowse, <laughs> the one and only, the one and only. Yeah. Although there is somebody on um, I, I, who comes to watch us when we play Birmingham on tours, whose name is Ian Prowse. Yeah. Is that your clone? No, no, no. He's a, <laughs> he he's a civilian. He lives in the real world, <laughs> <laughs> unlike me. And uh, yeah, and he, he comes to the shows with his dad, and it's really weird. Hi, oh, <laughs> <hey>, Prousey. Because <laughs> it's not it's an unusual name, you know. So it is. Yeah. I mean, sometimes first and middle. Like I I've met probably five Shannon Roses, and there was a Shannon Rose in my class, but first and last. Oh, okay. That's a yeah. lot. So you're just common, aren't you? Common as mob, Shannon. I am. <laughs> um, but all right, so let's get started here. I'm very excited because we're looking into building brand image here for success in the music community and like self-management. And I know you've got a lot of experience with that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, if, I mean, I have to say from the very outset that as somebody who started doing all of this inspired by punk rock, to be talking in terms of, you know, brand image and all of that yeah. is the antipathy of why I came in. Oh, I know. Um, so that it gives gives me the eebie-jeebies a bit to even think about it. But uh, there's no two ways about it. This, this is how the modern music industry is. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, been fortunate enough to make my way in it and my living out of it via just about every mode you can do it from the having a major label record deal in the 90s and then independent deals and now essentially i have like a whole uh, a whole team but essentially it's me and it's a cottage industry and the things the ideas of branding and all of that i i can see it at work every day and mm -hmm. i i'm involved in it you know i can't it cannot be denied <laughs> um and why not it's the modern way you know mm -hmm. Well, out of out of all of those experiences, which way do you think is easiest? Which way do you think is most complicated, or like any anything really? Um, it's a cliche, but it is swings and roundabouts. There was um, beneficial ways to the old uh -huh. system, uh, and there's beneficial ways to the new system. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's you know there was things that were not so good about the old system, and things that are not so good about the new one. So it's not the, n neither one trumps the other. But um, it, if I'm if you force me to to choose, then the new system is better okay. for me personally because mm -hmm. I make so much more money. To be <laughs> honest with you, uh, <laughs> it's true. Um, because if I sell a CD or a T-shirt or vinyl or a mug or a hat or anything, I keep every penny, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means I have to do all of the hard work. Yeah. Um, and I have to organize the, you know, go into the studio, I have to organize the producer, I have to write the songs. And then when uh, the, the album is finished, I sit there and I bag the thousands of copies of them to send out, you know. Yeah. And I don't mind doing it because that, that's then uh, there's no there's nobody uh, taking your money off you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's financially it's been really, really good for me, mm -hmm. the modern yeah. way. The old way, um, we got signed to Polydor in 1991, and they gave us a huge advance of, uh, I think it was £85,000. Mm -hmm. And the album, the first album we made, cost £95,000 to make. And then, the, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of pounds put into marketing, all of which you just, you couldn't compete in the music industry if, unless you did that sort of thing, unless you got signed. It was why, back in the day, it, the whole thing about getting signed was such a big deal mm -hmm. you know and you would walk as soon as you got signed you walked up and down bold street all day long yeah. hoping people would go they've just been signed uh which they often did mm -hmm. so that was the whole thing you know um 
in the modern era, if somebody came in for you to sign you, I'd actually advise you not to take the deal. Yeah, it's a it, there's a, there's much better ways around it nowadays. Mm -hmm. And if you got say some label come in, it's going to take everything, 360 degrees deal or whatever it is they call it. They get a little bit of your next breath and your firstborn and all of that. You don't need to do it that way these days. So the whole cachet of being signed has has changed. Which yeah. is if you'd have told the 21 year old me that was going to be the case, I wouldn't have been able to believe it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the great thing about the old one is, is you got if when you put your new music out, especially for the first time, you got access to being on the telly, being on the radio, I mean, you know, national radio. Yeah. First three Pele singles went straight onto the uh, Radio 1 playlist, you know, and we were on the telly quite a bit. And you, you'd get an agent. Once you got the deal, you'd get the agent and you'd get a publishing deal. So everything would fall into line. So you'd have some money. You'd be on the telly. You'd be out playing with bigger bands and all mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. So, uh, it, and if you if you broke, if the band broke, then you had, uh, you know, access to everything. Um, so that was the great thing about the old days. Mm -hmm. If I wrote Bridge Over Troubled Waters tomorrow, it wouldn't become the hit that it would have in the old days because there's a ceiling now. You know, yeah. you're not you're not allowed through that door because you don't have, you know, uh, all of the backing financially, but. To be honest with you, if you get played on the radio these days, it doesn't mean half as much as it did in the old days. So when I do get played on, say, Radio 6 or or whichever uh, channel, it doesn't, you know, if I go to my uh, PayPal to see if it's sold a few records, it never does. So it doesn't have the same power yeah. as it used to have. Whereas if I put up a, a brand new video on YouTube, then, the, you know, the, the orders come rolling in. Yeah. So it's a totally different world, mm -hmm. you know. So I prefer this one, I think. Yeah. Well, now, you you went from being signed uh, with a, a studio, and forgive me if I get the lingo wrong, I'm <laughs> trying, <laughs> but um, you went from being signed to a studio to an independent artist, so d you came into it with a bit of a following to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I, w the, the first thing that we did... With Pele is, and I'm, I'm, I've been trying for so long in a previous like school band to try and get somewhere. So when we finally did get the deal, you know, I, it was we just made a, a point at the very beginning to say to the agent, say to the management, we want to go out and play, and we want to use this time where we've got all this backing mm -hmm. from Polygram, you know, the major label, to try and reach out as to many people as possible, mm -hmm. play as many shows, so we've got a foundation. To, should anything go wrong in the future which mm -hmm. it's the music industry it's going to and it yeah. did you know and even to this day people uh, will come to our shows and they'll tell me oh I first saw you supporting the Pogues or supporting mm -hmm. Delamitri or when you played that festival with Wet 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 or whatever it is yeah. so that hard work that we put in in Pele we did like about nine tours mm -hmm. we were constantly on the road we did hundreds and hundreds of gigs and we became like a you know, a well known as a live band, and our T-shirts with the Pele logo of the four colours, they were fucking everywhere. We saw more of them. Yeah, we we did are. fucking yeah CDs, are. yeah. So, but that was just at the very beginning. We're gonna work our bollocks off, and we and we did. You know, yeah. we just went out and played. So when I kind of the music industry, uh, it, we had your classic problem of the guy who signed us left the label. The new guy who came in viewed us as the previous A&R guy's property and was kind of standoffish with us. Mm -hmm. um, the problem we had is they'd already picked us up the option to make a third album. So when they do that, they owe you money and they have to, you know, they're duty bound to uh, to begin the process of of uh, making the whole thing. But it, it, it just became clear that he didn't like us and we didn't like him. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, and it just fell apart. So for a long time, I was kind of, locked out you know I'd, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't get back in and during that time uh, the music industry changed you know mm -hmm. music became free the internet happened and um, uh, and it, it was uh, it was a really difficult time but the, the, the music industry uh, the whole thing with um, with television shows like X Factor where you that's how you got your record deal mm -hmm. and there was one calls it pop idols or pop stars won by a band called Hearsay and that was the very very first one and the industry panicked and thought you could they couldn't sign anybody over 25 after that 
So we all started lying about our age, you know. <laughs> um, which is which was a, a greatly amusing to my friends back home in Ellesmere Port. Mm-hmm. They all knew my age because I went to school with them all, and then they'd see this different age in the in the paper or somewhere. And uh, you were caught. And that, you were caught. Oh, it was so funny. I've got a really great mate, uh, Youngie, and he'd phone me up. He go, "I can't believe it! I can't believe it! You're not ten years younger than me. You're the same age as me." <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, I used to deliberately go ridiculously low, so I could, uh, so I, I would amuse Youngie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can't get away with it anymore. Don't need to now. So, uh, so that was it. When, when we, when I formed Amsterdam, uh, which was just exactly the same thing as Pele. Mm-hmm. It was just me writing songs. It was just a vehicle. Uh, like I'd written all the songs in Pele. And the reason why we had a different name is because the music industry insisted upon it. Because in their world, we'd had Pele, we'd done two albums and a live album, and it hadn't become massive. So they just considered us like, you know, yesterday's guitar strings. We were, oh, okay. that was, oh, we're not going to touch them. So you had to kind of reinvent yourself. You have to rebrand. Yeah, you did. You had to rebrand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it was. And it, it, it just felt like a nuisance because. We played our last gig as Pele in London. I'll never forget, we played the Astoria. And it was packed out, and there was a stage invasion of, every, you know, all the fans were going mad and singing along. Six months later, the, we'd fallen out with a record company, and I did my next gig in London two years later at the Bullen Gate. To, we were supposed to have about 10 record labels turn up. None did, and there was about 11 fans. So that slide down the snakes and ladders was profoundly depressing. Mm -hmm. And really, really, it was difficult to kind of get yourself back up. Well, how do you cope with that? Um, I'm uh, extremely tenacious. Uh, I had a couple of, I had a couple of, uh, friends and family, close people close to me, who said, oh, come on now, you know, you had your go, you had the big go on the swings mm-hmm. there with all the money and the major label, and, you know, maybe it's time to like, join the real world like the rest of us now. And they kind of they didn't really realise, with me, it's, to quote The Clash, it's death or glory. And I was, there was no way on earth I was going to stop. Mm-hmm. I just thought, well, I'm going to have to write even better songs. So I put pressure on myself. Yeah. And I wrote a bunch of songs, early Amsterdam songs, Taking on the World and Love Phenomenon and some others. And then uh, people would go, ah, oh, actually, this might, this might have a chance as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, a great producer called uh, Tony Kiley, who'd been the drummer in a band called The Blow Monkeys, and we'd become really good friends. And he's still my producer to this day. And he said, let me have a go and we'll... Mm-hmm. So we kind of form this team whereby we go, we'd spend what money we had and we'd go and record and see what it sounded like. And that was the beginnings of Amsterdam. And uh, they were good songs. So um, people started to kind of take notice again. But mm-hmm. I still couldn't get through the door of, you know, the, the whole industry opening to me until I wrote does this train stop on Merseyside? Mm-hmm. And then that opened all the doors again. And it was mainly John Peel. John Peel used to, um, would play it on his radio show, on BBC One radio show, and he would get really emotional when he played it. And it's lovely, because I've got the recordings of him doing that. And it's three or four times he goes to announce who th- who's playing the song, and his voice cracks, and he plays the next song. And about three songs later, he goes, I'm really sorry, I just can't play that song without getting emotional. <laughs> And uh, which is such an honour, you know, because mm-hmm. when I was a, when I was fifteen and sixteen, I'd listen to his radio show for the new single by the Jam mm-hmm. or the Undertones or whatever song he was playing. So it was like a full circle, and uh, and that was it. It kind of opened the door. We got a deal. We got an indie deal with a uh, London label called Beat Crazy, and we actually the first single they put into the top forty. So I was back then, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was some some dark times, you know, because mm-hmm. you've only you've you've. You've got a, and Ollie will know this. It, you, it, it's a, it's a lonely process, and there's only you that you can that that can really talk to. So you're having a conversation with yourself. Yeah. Can you do this? How do I slightly alter the way I'm approaching it to get a bit further up the ladder? You know, a, a rung up the ladder. What do I do next? Why isn't that working? You know, and and you've got to be tenacious. You've got to be a little bit mad with it. Because uh, it's a curse, you know. If you yeah. love it, it's what you do. It's a curse, and it I is. knew I was cursed by it. Um, uh, uh, in, in in Amsterdam, 
we had my um, my girlfriend was in the band, great mm-hmm. singer, um, looked fantastic, uh, really fabulous musician, great ear to you know to play piano and guitar. She could play mm-hmm. a bit of flute, and then. Uh, she dumped me, <laughs> but she's still in the band. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, oh, for fuck's sake, what do I do here? Because yeah. we saw her as a kind of a secret weapon uh, to to maybe get us, and she was younger as well, so maybe she'll get us someone up the ladder. So we're kind of mm-hmm. constantly assessing the situation: how do we get out the shit here where we're, we're going nowhere with the early Amsterdam record? And it, it just it, it came to pass that I couldn't possibly be in the band with her any longer for one reason or another. <laughs> and I remember some of the band members going, oh, for fuck's sake, what's he doing now? <laughs> and as it happened, it turned out to be a, a, a good choice because we kind of became a, like a, an all-lad band kind of gang thing then. And that kind of played into our favour, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we, we weren't trying to be something that we were, that, you know, we, we didn't really feel like we should be. Um but we, but the reason why I tell you that particular story is we were constantly looking at where's what's going to open the doors for us. Mm-hmm. You know, in the end, it turned out to be just a song that opened the doors for us. Mm-hmm. But we didn't know that until it happened. But you had to try a million things before you got to well, that y- one. Yeah, but without you can't ever chase it musically. You got to keep the music who you are. If yeah. there's a new sound that comes around and you think, oh, I'll try sounding a bit like that yeah. that genre or that style mm-hmm. then you're on a hiding to nothing because mm-hmm. if you, you if you miss out on that one mm-hmm. and the next one comes along you'll all try that one you you're uh, you're just going to be exposed as a as like not really being yeah you know you have to stand still and it comes around to you in the mm-hmm. end and well i was i was just talking to a teacher that i'm doing research with at the university and i was telling her about this uh, project because this is towards my master's thesis and everything and i was like a trend that keeps popping up in all of the interviews is people find that they do better once they get to a point performing where they can let their own personality shine and they they find their groove and just something that you notice in people is when they're genuine but that is so hard to study and talk about and yeah. prove academically. But it's it's true. It's, you know, the people who you enjoy watching the most are the people who are just 100% themselves. Yeah, 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 and absolutely. And you can tell. Yeah, yeah. and it, you, you, you're 100% right. And you can tell. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can tell when I'm uh, out playing with, with our band, if I say you watch your support band or whatever it is, or I can tell when I do the Monday Club, mm-hmm. you know, if somebody has got has found who they are and they're and they're mining that you know mm-hmm. um then you, it, it's apparent immediately yeah. and um but you have to go if you're young and you're just getting going you do have to go through a whole load of yeah. different things and a different process to finally get where you were mm-hmm. i did it with when we when we uh, were at school we had this band and we were really into like the clash and the jam and there's loads of great liverpool bands there was a band from here called afraid of mice and he, the singer still comes into the Monday Club, Phil Jones, mm-hmm. every now and again. Absolutely as mad as a fucking hatter. But they were great when they came out and they were like the, the mm-hmm. band. And we were like, oh, we want to be like that. But my songwriting just, I'd written some good songs, but it was, wasn't up until five years later when I first heard uh, an album called Fisherman's Blues by the Waterboys, mm-hmm. which is like the first time I'd really been exposed to the Celtic soul. And it touched something so deeply inside me mm-hmm. that my own songwriting came into focus and that's when I found my true self that you were talking about mm-hmm. then and that was me and it's never changed since then yeah. that's when I, I kind of opened a door that I, I, I knew where I was and I knew how, how to write the songs then and when you yeah. when you're writing your songs you know you've got a good one mm-hmm. you know um, and that was that that came around with that and then Bruce Springsteen around the same time were the two big important ones for me. But I was playing, you know, five, six, seven years before that, writing songs. Yeah. They they were good, but they weren't, they couldn't get me out the mire, you know. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, it is, it is hard because when you're, when you're on the stage, you just, you, you freeze up. I mean, I'm sure you remember, or may, <laughs> maybe, maybe you will. The first time I played Monday Club, it really felt like I was just up there and I shit myself and forgot who I was <laughs> for the yeah, entire time yeah. that I was on there. I, I, I like that, though. I like yeah. that. I like that it feels like you're doing your driving test every time you get up. Yeah. 
and I, um, I, I still have it now. When when we we go on tour on on Saturday and before the gig, I'll have to go for a walk because I'll just be my head will be wrecked yeah. with it all. That I, I and I'll be I can't do it. I can't do it. So I'm so nervous about it yeah. all because you're presenting yourself out there in mm-hmm. front of everybody, and my band laugh at me. They go, "Are you going for your walk? Are you? Yeah. Why? <laughs> what, why wouldn't I?" And they're all laughing because they don't care, you know. Mm. They're all very confident. They're all fantastic players. And they're confident what they're going to do and get up and do it. And I'm just like, what happens if a spaceship lands on the venue? (laughs) 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 Or something something ridiculous, you know. And I have to talk to myself and calm down. Mm. Um, But I like that when people get up at the Monday Club that they feel nervous. Because then that shows that it's, it's not just throwaway. Yeah. The 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 idea of the the club itself that it's not just a couple of speakers and a mic in the corner of a pub and they're trying to kind of get a, you know make yeah. some money behind a bar or whatever they know that it's a it's a proper thing. Yeah. And, it's an uh, institution. Yeah, and it's and it's good that I've I've got a, a few friends. Um, uh, Caroline England, mm-hmm. she uh, whenever I'm plugging her in, and Caroline's played there a hundred times. She always looks at me and she goes, why do I get nervous when I play here mm-hmm. and I don't anywhere else? Yeah. And I just, I haven't got, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well then but, tell, tell us a little bit about the Monday Club because some people watching may, may not know. Uh, okay, well it's 11 and a half years old now and it's, um, and I'm very proud of it because I've, I've always taken it seriously mm-hmm. because I real I wish I'd had something like that when I was a kid yeah. you know that I could go and play on the most one of the most musical streets in the whole world mm-hmm. in one of the most musical cities and in the most famous club that you could come into and sing your own songs you mm-hmm. know and through proper equipment you know there's no you know there's no uh, dodgy this that or the other mm-hmm. or it's proper and and have somebody who would make sure the audience are listening and make sure they give you a round of applause, however it's gone, you know. And I wish I'd have had that. So I'm I'm, I'm proud of it that we've been around for so long and that so many people enjoy it. Yeah. And I made so many friends as well mm-hmm. out of it, you know, outside of the actual Monday night, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, and l- long may it continue. Mm-hmm. I hope to have one day to have said that we've lasted for 20 years mm-hmm. you know uh, so we're eight years off that yeah. that'll be a party won't it <laughs> oh yeah well on our way yeah. well on our yeah. way yeah Jesus yeah but uh, no it is it is really cool and um, where do you think that intimidation comes from because I know what you mean I mean I, I'm there every week so I'm definitely less intimidated than I was yeah. but there is still something about it I get more nervous there than anywhere else I think it's about seriousness, I think, and it it it's a serious to get up and play on one of the cavern stages, mm-hmm. uh, two people. Uh, I, I engender into a, an essence of seriousness. It isn't throwaway, and and your songs that you've written are serious because that's you, you know, that is mm-hmm. your and everybody who gets up. That's why the key to the Monday Club, the reason why it survived, is that rule that you can't do covers. Mm-hmm. It's really, really important because it has gathered everybody like a like a magnet of it of creativity. Mm-hmm. And in that, you know, when you're sitting on the end of your bed writing your songs, it's a serious matter to you. You know, you've in in that song it embodies like your dreams of where they might take you, mm-hmm. a- along with you feel good because you've expressed yourself. You know, mm-hmm. and there's been an act of creativity. It didn't la- it didn't exist ten minutes ago, and now there's this song. You know, I know all of your songs from the Monday Club. Mm-hmm. There was there was a time not so long ago they didn't exist, and now they're there. Yeah. And when I hear them, I can sing along to them. You know, mm-hmm. and I I've never got over the fact how magical that is for all mm-hmm. of us songwriters. Um, and the Monday Club lives and falls on that ethos, and I like that people get up and are, and are nervous because it means that they're taking it serious mm-hmm. and that it it has a, an effect upon them. If they just threw it away, and we do get people who get up and just throw it away, mm-hmm. and um, and they don't give a fuck, and it, and it's just like oh whatever. And silently inside, I'm antagonised by that because I, I take it seriously Mm -hmm. and a lot of other people take it seriously and music is serious you know Mm -hmm. it's like i always went went, i remember years ago there was when people go out on a saturday night to watch a fun band that annoys me 
you know that uh, and they get like dressed up and the band that they're watching is like a comedy band yeah um i remember years ago uh, and they're almost watching the band ironically. Yeah. I remember years ago, I had some friends in Ellesmere Port, and they were all going to watch, this is pre the uh, Gary Glitter thing, they were going to watch the Glitter Band, but they're all going ironically dressed in glitter yeah. and to listen to all those old songs from their youth. And that annoys me. Mm-hmm. I've got to be honest, it, it annoys yeah. me, because music's not fucking, it's not comedy. Yeah. It's well, not wasn't funny. wasn't it on The X Factor at one point, there was like a big joke that they kept sending someone through who was really bad, right. and then all of a sudden they ended up to the final four, and he was one of them, okay. and everyone was like, oh, never mind, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that, that's about TV. It's got nothing at all to do with art or yeah. music, isn't it? And uh, yeah, and I've, I've always found comedy music annoying. Yeah. I hate musicals. <laughs> I don't know. I hate musicals because you go because it, it, it's using the vehicle of music for something that I, I I can't believe in. You know, you'll be watching a musical and then all of a sudden they'll like fiddler on the roof. They'll break into singing with this phony over over affected voice. <laughs> hey, yeah, I hate it. <laughs> that is not what fucking Joe Strummer taught us. That's not why we're here. So. Um, yeah, I do, honestly. I, I don't like... I've never liked it. It's I've never seen you this angry. I know, yeah. <laughs> it's only Monday as well. As like <laughs> but I, do, I, I guess it's because where I came in to music was with, you know, Paul Weller, Joe Strummer, you know, or, or that great Elvis Costello, that great punk rock explosion, and their... The re- they were like writing songs and playing music to change the world. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They wanted to change the world. They wanted to commentate on it and make it a better world. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where I came in. So I was hit with that fire and I'm still tainted with it. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh goodness, let's. I don't even know where to go from that. That was just <laughs> Bra- back to branding. The, okay, back to that was that was a journey I did not expect to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get you tickets to like Lion King the musical. For, for <laughs> I wouldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, that is definitely that's got to be a big part of your brand image then, and the, why people follow you then. Um, not not because you hate musicals, yeah. but because just you seem to be. <laughs> I guess purist is the the maybe the word just about the the process and it being deep and it being serious. I, yeah, I I never, I've never analysed it. Yeah, do you know what I mean? But I, I, well, if, here, anybody here who likes are. my music, you know, wherever they come watch me or they buy the records or whatever, they know that it's going to be um, emotional and mm-hmm. uh, you know and honest and kind of whether it be a comment upon the, the world that we live in or yeah. a relationship thing, you know, uh, they're just, they're, it's just kind of an honest song. Mm-hmm. Or like uh, my, my daughter, who's 11 now, she's been a muse since she arrived, mm-hmm. you know, so, because um, that blows your mind when you become a parent, you know, I was, I, bec- I was older when I became a parent as well. So you just write honestly about your life and your experiences. Yeah. And I think anybody who likes me knows that that's what they're gonna get, mm-hmm. and that will resonate in some way in their lives. Yeah. Um, I I always used to say as a joke on stage that I only ever write about two things: one is trying to change the world, and the other one is about getting dumped. But I've realised that in the past <laughs> two records, <laughs> I've started to write a lot about death as well, but not like from a morose perspective i mean how can you write about death and it not be morose you know the finality of it but i i've written quite a bit about it as as um is sort of like something that that we should uh, uh, it, you can celebrate people's lives when they pass away mm-hmm. and they and that the, a certain aspect of them they don't die because they re- you you know they they're still part of you and mm-hmm. your memories of them and your relationships and they stay in your psyche don't they mm-hmm. and I've, I've even written a song called here i lie about the future when i'm not here for our rosie so the and in the song she comes and visits my graveside when she's having a bad day and she she talks to me and because she knows mm-hmm. that song exists when that does finally come to pass 
she it will like it will make some weird cosmic circle. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and I always say that'll be like music defeating death itself. Mm -hmm. um, which if music has any power, and we you know how much God dear God how much do we love music? Mm -hmm. um, then it might well have those hidden powers within it. Mm -hmm. um, so. And also people from the past who might have passed away, they've, they, they, they kind of, you know, you read about maybe your heroes or whatever and what they added to the world and how they changed the world. And uh, so there's a, a sense of that that goes into it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my branding, you know, yeah. broken hearts, death <laughs> and fighting the man. <laughs> it's one way to do it. It's yeah. one way to do it. Um, well, look at the the power of music because I think that comes into play. Yeah, it's it's a very it is a very powerful thing. Oh, yeah. I was listening this morning to a song called by a Ringo Starr called Photograph. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard it for about five or six years. Um, All I've got is a photograph. <laughs> it's just f finish me off. Yeah, he wrote it with George. Yeah. Finish me off. It's. You know, and it's mad that, you know, this is the, the power of the Beatles. Yeah. All four of them were in the charts at the same time in like 1971 or whatever yeah. after they split up. And Ringo at one point was the most successful. <laughs> God, I love that. You know, you two couldn't do that. Or the other bands that they always claim might be the bigger bands in the world, Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. Rolling Stones, none of them could do that. And, um, and that song is, it, it, it's just, it's a very, very simple song. But the, the melancholy in it, it's mm. a very Liverpool thing as well, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that's something that I, that always strikes me, the melancholy in songs, and you can't you can't consciously put it into the song either. Mm -hmm. It's something you do subconsciously. Mm -hmm. All those words that I've ever written, uh, I didn't think about any of them. Uh, really, they just kind of came from the subconscious. Yeah. You know, I, th I think if you if you try and consciously write something, it's always rubbish. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to connect on a. On a on a on an almost magical level, yeah. you know. Well, what do you what do you think is the best advice you could give to someone who's more at the start of this sort of journey? Then, um, always keep writing. Mm -hmm. Always keep writing, because um, you know you just you, you do incrementally just learn a little bit more as you go along you probably don't even notice that that's happening but you do and you pick up little fragments of other music other artists other lyrics other modes of thinking and you just get a little bit better and better mm -hmm. so if your first set of songs um don't quite take you to where you want to go then you know just Keep writing as you go along, and there'll be at some point a, a gem will pop out, mm -hmm. um, which is more undeniable than the other ones that you've done. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, but essentially, the, the story of me and my career is the is the the uh, the tortoise and the hare. So you just don't don't fucking give up. Keep going, plodding along slowly but surely, and you mm -hmm. will eventually overtake the hare. You know, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what I did. I just didn't. Just never gave up. Just kept writing, mm -hmm. kept thinking, kept my eye on the ball. You know, had some bad luck like you do, but had some good luck as well. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the thing. And make sure you got a good logo. <laughs> I've got three. <laughs> I've got Pele, Amsterdam, Harry, and Prowse, which somebody pointed out to me the other day, and I didn't even hadn't even thought about it. Mm -hmm. You've got you've got three brands. Fucking hell, yeah. Yeah, I have, yeah. But the Pele one sells the most, so I use that the most because <laughs> of the colours. Um, even though Pele is an actual act, it hasn't played for a very long time and <laughs> never will ever again. <laughs> the original Pi Pele members, so. But it doesn't matter, it was me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> why Pele? Like, why? I was why just a footballer. Is yeah, it? Yeah, it was in honour of the footballer. I'm from a, a, you know, a council estate in Ellesmere Port, mm -hmm. which means means several things, but it means <laughs> o over and above football. Football, mm -hmm. football, fucking football, as my mother would... We used to say, she wouldn't say fucking, but she'd say bloody, because it was always on the telly. <laughs> and if she stood in front of the telly while me and my dad were trying to watch sports nights, she said, get out of the way, get out of the way. And it would only be like... Watford against Oxford in the <laughs> in the same odd cup or something, but we were just obsessed with football. And you you, you know you you take it wherever you could back in the day, 
and being uh, you know the, the port is a is a satellite town an overspill town for Liverpool mm -hmm. and Liverpool is football isn't it so you know nobody in our town supported anybody other than uh, Liverpool or Everton yeah. you know it was just such a a strong grip on it and um, so that was it you know that we I, I in honor of the greatest footballer of all time as it was uh, that we just called our, our, our band Pele mm -hmm. you know that might might be one of the most Liverpool things that I've ever heard. One of the most scout thi <laughs> scouts things we named our band after the football because Liverpool music football. That's like yeah. th that's the two categories. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's well, it's football, music, and politics in Liverpool, and that's it. You better and get on, your songs are very yeah. You, you better get on board. <laughs> you know, uh, one one night at the Monday Club when we we closed on, I did it for love. Yeah, and I dragged one of my friends up to play lead. Uh, afterwards, he goes. You didn't tell me that you were having me like sing on a communist manifesto. <laughs> who, who was it? You're not going to tell me. It's a song about Che Guevara, yeah? Yeah. yeah. yeah he's oh. like, he could have warned me. <laughs> well, Che Guevara was a lot more than a communist. Yeah. You know, and, and, he, and he might not have even described himself as a communist. He was a revolutionary. Mm. And he, uh, you know, and uh, he, d he did the impossible. And him and Fidel Castro and... <laughs> And the Cuban Revolution, he did the impossible and beat the Americans, uh, and continued to to beat them uh, and yeah. and defy them to this day. So uh, he definitely deserves a song because uh, <laughs> you know what he achieved, and he was yeah. a doctor as well, and a and a very uh, you know interesting man and a brave mm -hmm. man. And uh, they hate that people still uh, revere him because he mm -hmm. he represents something that's a genuine threat to them, mm -hmm. um, which is probably would have been. Why your friend was uh, appalled because he would have read some propaganda against him at some <laughs> point. Uh, ask him, does he want to get up again? And I'll, <laughs> I'll make a point <laughs> down the microphone. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do we that. We have a, for sure. uh, we have um, a Thatcherite on the stage, and I'm going to force him to play. <laughs> going to force him to play a guitar solo <laughs> in honour of uh, Che Guevara and the 1959 Cuban Revolution. <laughs> you know, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> I love stuff like that. <laughs> oh God! All right. Well, do you want to leave it on that? <laughs> yeah. Should we leave it on that? And then I'm. Uh, you can tell me off air who it was. <laughs> oh my God! Are we ready?
Well, thank you so much, Ian. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you for having me, Shannon. Oh, I hope uh, I hope the red shutter uh, world goes well for you. I hope so too. <laughs> I foolishly asked you why it's called the red shutter. <laughs> thing. <laughs> to be fair, my cousin texted me last night and was like, "It was at marker eight minutes six seconds that I figured out why." <laughs> So, uh, but that was that was Lydia Lydia Rigby. She was like, "Oh, the background there will be." She's not Scouse, but yeah. oh, the background it'll be iconic. The red shutters, and I'm like, and then I fought with my mom. Branding should, should be sh- show or club. But yes, thank you so much for joining us. Anytime. All right, and thank you for joining us as well. Go leave your home. It's funny how people do it, and it? it's just, it's just all uh, quite, quite a few of the members of my band are from outside the area, but they all come into rehearsals. Oh, Hanella, that was a gone. <laughs>